Hello everyone. It is 5 o'clock in Europe. It is 11 a.m. EST and we are all together here for an online meeting to understand how to design a satellite link. Thank you very much all of you for joining today. Thank you very much everyone for joining today. As I said in the video, we have the opportunity today to witness live the design of a satellite link. And for those of you who are worried about the security or doing research in quantum, it's going to include quantum key distribution, the so-called QKD. We are here today with VPI Photonics and with 260 people registered. All of us, all of us are going to learn something today, including me, because what I'm going to learn is how to make sure that this meeting is useful for everyone. Chris, thank you very much for being with us today. Let's start the show today. I would like to give the floor to my very good friend, Chris Maloney. Chris, thank you very much for bringing us into designing a satellite link. The floor and the attention of these 260 people registered is yours. Yes, thank you, Jose. I'm very excited about this industry tutorial today. Um, we'll be talking about the simulation of classical and quantum communications over free space optical satellite links. So I'm actually joined today by some technical experts. Uh, we have Rosa Navitskaya, uh, who's a senior modeling engineer, and Piotr Novik, who's a R&D engineer with a focus in quantum technologies. So welcome, Rosa and Peter, today as well. Um, if, you're, if you're unfamiliar with, uh, with VPI Photonics, I'll just give a high-level overview about who we are. But we've been providing software and services for photonic design and automation um, for now over 25 years. Um, so we're an international um, company. Our headquarters is in Berlin, Germany. Um, and we like to describe our software as being integrated, interoperable, and industry-leading. Um, so today we're really going to focus on the, um, the integrated aspect of this. So you'll see our optical system software um, together with our, our QKD toolkit today. Um, and also um, the software is industry leading. So some of the, the, the quantum toolkit that came out of, uh, that you'll see today came out of a European commission sponsored project called Unicorn. So to give you a, a, an overview of the software tools that we provide, we actually provide tools that cover different uh, levels of abstraction. So at the very highest level, we have link engineering tools. This is mainly used by internet service providers and equipment vendors um, to design optical fiber networks and to cost optimize those, those networks. Um, today, we're actually gonna be focusing at the transmission design level um, where we can um, use this software to design uh, for different applications like um, short reach, long haul, data center interconnects, satellite links, um, but also LIDAR systems as well. Um, and then also what we won't focus on today, but we also have tools for component design. This would be for photonic integrated circuits, for fiber-based devices like fiber amplifiers. And we also go all the way down to the device simulation level for really the, the getting into the deep physics behind waveguides and fibers. Um, so, so today, the tools that we're going to use are at the transmission design level, as I mentioned. It will be this VPI transmission maker optical systems. So Rosa will, will get us started um, showing the free space optical channel model and some um, satellite link demonstrations there. And then we have a, a VPI toolkit for QKD that Pewter will leverage and show how that um, can be used within VPI transmission maker optical systems. So with that, I'd like to get in a little bit just to give some, some background about the satellite industry and some trends. Um, I know today we'll be discussing free space optical communication simulations as it pertains to this industry. But keep in mind that the, the free space optical channel model that you'll see today um, can actually be applied for other technologies outside of this industry for LIDAR or terrestrial uh, laser communications as well. Um, and one interesting point to note about this industry is that um, when you think about satellites, you might think about manufacturing and the launch industry, but this is actually a small portion of the industry. It only makes up about 7% of the revenues, um, and SpaceX is actually captured about half of the launch revenues, and they're projecting that segment only to grow by about 5% each year. Um, now, a, large, a larger portion of the revenues are captured by, of course, ground equipment, but what we're going to focus on today are the applications and, and services. 
Um, currently, this space is dominated more by the, the television um, application, but one of the growing services is satellite broadband internet, and which can provide value to rural areas or sparsely populated areas, which are currently underserved. So right now, and you can see in the, the chart on the right here, um, the broadband uh, internet makes only a small fraction of the satellite services uh, market, but that's actually projected to grow at a compound annual growth rate, CAGR, of, uh, of about 28%. Um, and it's actually expected to become a significant portion of that services segment. And in regards to constellations of satellites, um, most of which plan to provide uh, broadband internet services by creating a web of connected satellites in orbit around the Earth. There's about 45,000 satellites that are planned to be launched by about 45 different companies. 3,000 of those satellites are already in orbit. And most of those satellites, they're RF-based right now, but to provide the, the data rates required for high-speed internet access, laser-based solutions will be implemented. And um, SpaceX's Starlink actually launched about 50 laser-based satellite, uh, satellites last year. Airbus already has an operational all optical communication system in space. Um, and one, one, another interesting thing is that half of the operational satellites that are in space right now are for commercial and nonprofit communications. And the government space budgets are actually not even included in this, um, in this plot here on the right. So that actually makes up another $100 billion segment. And governments have additional requirements uh, for secure communications, which we'll go, which we'll actually demonstrate uh, today in more detail um, in regards to simulating quantum key distribution or QKD systems for free space optical links. Now, getting into getting more into free space optics, of course, that has its advantages. So we mentioned already higher data rates, higher frequency and bandwidth, a license-free spectrum. Um, it, it satisfies some of the requirements for size, weight, and power. Um, so it's size, weight, power, and performance. Um, and, but there, it comes with disadvantages as well, which we want to address uh, a number of these actually in the, in the simulations of our software. So that would actually be some of the performance degradation due to uh, atmospheric scintillation, um, link outages due to weather conditions, um, and, and there's strong requirements for pointing acquisition and tracking systems as well. Um, so with that, that's really a high, high level overview of who, who we are at VPI Photonics, um, what the state of the industry is. And at this point, I'd like to turn things over to Rosa, who's our, our free space optical uh, expert to get into some of the, the simulation theory about, around free space optics and to um, show us a few uh, actually demonstrations within uh, the software. So, so Rosa, feel free, you can go ahead and share your screen and, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Chris, for an introduction and hello, everybody. In my presentation, I would like to discuss the theoretical models that we provide to simulate a free space optical channel in satellite links and also to show you several application examples directly in our simulation software. Uh, so, in general, the free space optical links can be divided into three large groups, such as terrestrial links, airborne links, and space links. And today I will focus on space links only, such as a satellite uplink, downlink, and ETA satellite link. Here you can see a simple scheme of a satellite uplink and downlink, where the signal is transmitted between the satellite and the ground station. And the position of the satellite in such a link is defined by the zenith angle and the transmission link length. Here we consider a LEO satellite, and in such case, its uh, altitude can be calculated using this simple expression. Two main physical effects that need to be considered in such link include uh, first uh, received power fluctuations in time due to atmospheric insulation that depend on the turbulent strengths in the atmosphere and have some statistical distribution, and uh, average attenuation in the free space link. That comes from the beam diffraction divergence in free space, uh, also additional scintillation induced divergence, and also uh, additional atmospheric losses due to absorption, scattering, and some adverse weather conditions. 
uh, the main adverse effect that can limit the performance of an FSO link is the atmospheric scintillation that comes from refractive index of fluctuations in the atmosphere. It is measured in terms of scintillation index uh, that corresponds to the normalized variance of, of on-axis intensity fluctuations. In the case of satellite links, the size of the beam at the receiver is usually much larger than the receiver aperture diameter, so we consider a point receiver and uh, don't account for the aperture averaging effects in the scintillation index calculations. To consider more accurately the case of uh, strong fluctuations in the atmosphere, uh, the scintillation index is calculated using extended rate of approximation uh, that considers independent effect of large scale and small scale uh, turbulent eddies on the beam propagation. Here you can see an example of a Gaussian beam propagation uh, through a turbulent free space channel. And already after several, several kilometers of propagation, the beam shape is not a Gaussian anymore. It has some uh, irregular turbulent uh, fluctuations uh, with several uh, hotspots. So to calculate the scintillation index, it's important to know the turbulence properties of the atmosphere. This is defined in terms of refractive index structure parameter, cn squared, uh, that in the case of satellite links changes with altitude and also in general it changes with time and location. Several models were developed to uh, describe this uh, cn squared altitude profile uh, based on experimental measurements of temperature and pressure fluctuations in the atmosphere. Here you can see some examples of these uh, cn squared models. And one of the most universal ones is a Hofnagel Valley model uh, that includes uh, several variables, such as, for example, turbulence level near the ground, defined by A parameter, and the root mean square wind speed in the high altitude atmospheric layers that can also include the satellite slew rate. Here you can see the expressions that we use in our simulation software to calculate the scintillation index for uplink and downlink uh, satellite channels. Basically, this is calculated through integration over all atmospheric layers uh, from the ground station altitude to the satellite altitude. And the scintillation index depends on the CN squared profile, the zenith angle of the satellite, as well as the wavelengths and input beam parameters. These expressions uh, were derived for Kolmogorov model of the scintillation power spectrum and are valid for any turbulence conditions from uh, weak to strong. In addition to the scintillation index, it's important also to uh, know the average attenuation in the free space link that comes from uh, geometrical beam divergence, so this means uh, beam diffraction divergence in free space, and additional scintillation-induced divergence that results in some long-term beam size that can be larger than uh, diffraction-limited beam size. So usually, uh, scintillation-induced divergence is negligible for downlink, but it can be uh, significant for uplink, depending on the parameters of the input beam. In addition to the geometrical and scintillation-induced attenuation, we also consider uh, some additional general attenuation that can come from atmospheric uh, absorption, scattering, some uh, weather conditions, or other uh, factors. Uh, so the effect of atmospheric scintillation on the received power fluctuations can be uh, described as if some uh, random time-dependent attenuation was applied to the signal in addition to the average attenuation in the free space link. To describe the scintillation-induced power fluctuations in the free space link, uh, several statistical models were developed uh, that are valid for different uh, levels of turbulence in the atmosphere. One of the most simple of them is log, norm log normal model uh, that is valid for weak turbulence. And uh, one of the most universal ones is gamma gamma uh, PDF that is uh, valid for any turbulence level from weak to strong. And in our simulation software, we provide both these models. Here you can see also an example of uh, um, output signal waveform after propagation through the turbulent free space channel, where the subsequent uh, signal blocks correspond to independent scintillation events and different levels of uh, power uh, fluctuations. So here it is important to note that in reality, the time scale of independent scintillations is about microsecond to millisecond and even larger. But in the simulation, we have the duration of uh, signal blocks of about several nanoseconds. And that's why we use statistical approach to perform such kind of simulations. So now we have discussed the theoretical models of a free space channel that we use to simulate satellite links. And uh, 
in the real applications, it's also important to perform system simulations. For this, such performance metrics as uh, beta rate or symbol error rate can be calculated uh, depending on different link parameters, such as zenith angle of the satellite, launch power, receiver diameter, and so on, as well as the other link characteristics uh, that can include scintillation index, uh, total attenuation, transmitted beam size, or other. In addition to this, it's uh, usually necessary to perform optimization of the link performance. This can include the use of uh, mitigation techniques to uh, reduce the effects of atmospheric scintillation, for example, or some other adverse effects in the free space link. And this may include such techniques as transmitter and receiver diversity, the use of optimal modulation formats, adaptive optics, uh, digital signal processing, and forward, er forward error correction algorithms. Okay, so now let's go directly to the software and have a look at the application examples. Uh, here you can see a simple example of a free space satellite link where a signal with uh, NRZ or K modulation is transmitted uh, through a satellite uplink or downlink. And the atmospheric channel here is simulated using an FSO channel module. Uh, this module specifies uh, the link type, uh, the distance between the satellite and the ground station, as well as the satellite zenith angle. Uh, the model used to simulate um, distribution of scintillation induced power fluctuations, scene squared profile, and so on. Here we can see the LEO satellite with the altitude of 300 kilometers and variable zenith angle. So after the transmission through the free space atmospheric channel, the signal is uh, detected at the receiver and, this, uh, and then a uh, beta rate is calculated. To simulate the effect of atmospheric scintillation, uh, we iterate this schematic several uh, times, each uh, iteration corresponding to independent scintillation event. And after this, we analyze the total value of beta rate for the accumulated statistics. So let's run this simulation and have a look at the results. Okay, uh, so here you can see the CN squared altitude profile that describes the turbulence strength dependence on the altitude. And to plot to the right shows the gamma gamma PDF that is used to simulate the scintillation induced normalized power fluctuations. Also, we calculated the beta rate value as well as scintillation index for this particular link configuration that corresponds to zero zenith angle of the satellite. And here you can see the received signal that is composed of uh, 50 independent signal blocks corresponding to independent scintillation events and different level of, levels of power fluctuations. Okay, so now uh, we can analyze the performance of this link. And for this, uh, we will uh, run the simulation for different values of the satellite zenith angle and different values of the wind speed in the uh, higher altitude atmospheric layers. So let's have a look at the results. All the simulations take several minutes to run, so I will just open the results. So here plots to the left corresponds to different zenith angles, and plots to the right show dependence on the wind speed. Here you can see how the shape of uh, gamma gamma PDF changes with the satellite zenith angle uh, when it uh, moves from uh, zenith to horizon. And also, here you can see the corresponding plots of beta rate and scintillation index versus the zenith angle of the satellite. So for zenith angles as large as 60 degrees and larger, uh, the turbulence level is already quite uh, high. So the scintillation index is large and beta rate values are also high. So it's not possible to achieve error-free transmission in such configuration. Approximately the same happens for high wind speed values, as you can see here. So the scintillation index increases with the wind speed as well as the beta rate. And here you can see the effect of the wind speed on the CN squared profile. Uh, so larger wind speeds corresponds to a higher uh, bump in this CN squared profile for altitudes of uh, uh, from about 5 to 20 kilometers. Okay, so now we see how the performance of the link uh, depends on the turbulent properties of the atmosphere. And now let's go to another example uh, where we will investigate 
uh, different modulation formats and their performance over a satellite downlink. So here we have two signals, one with NRZ or K modulation and another with pulse position modulation with three bits per symbol. And both these signals are said to have the same uh, bit rate. Uh, these signals are propagated through a satellite downlink, uh, which is simulated. Uh, that uh, the atmospheric channel in this link is simulated using FSO channel module. As in the previous example, uh, we have similar parameters, a gamma gamma PDF here and a Hufnagel Valley model for CN squared profile, but with different parameters of transmitter and receiver, as well as a um, uh, bit higher wavelengths and uh, a bit higher uh, altitude of the satellite orbit. Here, uh, again, as in the previous example, we will iterate this schematic several times to accumulate the scintillation statistics and then analyze the total arbitrary rate value for both modulation formats. So let's have a look at the results. Uh, so this plot shows the dependence of bitter rate on received optical power uh, for both modulation formats. And here we uh, run this simulation for equal average launch powers for both NRZ and PPM. Uh, so we see that for equal average launch powers and equal received optical powers, uh, the bitter rate are different and the PPM uh, corresponds to lower beta rate that uh, than NRZ signal. And to have approximately equal uh, uh, beta rate values, uh, the uh, power for PPM need to be set 9 dB or lower than for NRZ. So uh, for all the subsequent simulations, uh, we set the power for PPM uh, lower 9 dB than for NRZ to have approximately equal beta rates. And here, uh, you can see the dependence of beta rate on, uh, uh, on the satellite elevation when the satellite moves from uh, horizon to zenith. Uh, so beta rate uh, decreases in such case. And here also uh, we investigated the dependence of beta rate on the A parameter of CN squared uh, that corresponds to uh, different levels of turbulence near the ground. And uh, uh, we see that beta rate increases with the level of turbulence near the ground uh, for both NRZ and PPM. And finally, in this example, we can investigate the dependence of beta rate on receiver aperture diameter. So for larger receiver aperture, a larger uh, part of the beam is captured by the receiver and the total attenuation uh, in, in the link is uh, uh, decreased in such case. So this leads to lower beta rate values for post modulation formats. So in general, uh, we see that the dependencies of beta rate on different link parameters are similar for both NRZ and PPM, but the main advantage of PPM is that it requires uh, less uh, average launch power than NRZ uh, modulation. So in our example, this is 9 dB power difference. Okay, so now let's discuss the free space optical channel model for intersatellite link. And in this, in this case, uh, the physical effects that need to be considered are a bit different. Uh, so uh, the signal is propagated in vacuum and there is no atmospheric scintillation anymore. Uh, so, uh, but there is still uh, received power fluctuations in time that can result from pointing errors. The pointing errors uh, uh, can happen because of random uh, jitter of the transmitter and receiver satellites while they move uh, along their orbits. Also, there is an average attenuation in the free space links a link due to the beam divergence uh, due to diffraction, as well as the frequency shift due to the Doppler effect. To simulate uh, received power fluctuations due to point narrows, uh, we can again use statistical approach and uh, uh, a random jitter of the transmitter and receiver satellites results in uh, some random displacement of the received, uh, received beam relative to the aperture of the receiver. And this angular displacement, a random angular displacement, can be uh, simulated using a region distribution. This distribution is uh, derived for the case when there is a static bias point in error of phi, as well as um, uh, random Gaussian distributed displacements along the y and x axis. And in this case, we calculate the received uh, power uh, using the approximation of the point a receiver, as well as for satellite uplink and downlink. This is quite an accurate approximation for inter-satellite links in the majority of cases. In addition to the pointing error, it is important to consider Doppler effect. 
Uh, so, Doppler effect causes frequency shift of the received signal relative to the transmitted signal. And uh, this frequency shift uh, depends uh, basically on the uh, wavelengths of the transmitted signal and on the positions of the satellites relative to each other, uh, specifically their uh, radio velocities. So, with a bit of approximation, we can calculate the shift uh, from the radial velocity of the receiver satellite relative to the transmitter satellite. In general, the value of um, the frequency shift is about uh, several uh, gigahertz, up to tens of gigahertz for different uh, parameters. And it can be higher for smaller wavelengths and larger uh, relative velocities that can happen, for example, for two LEO satellites moving in the opposite directions. Uh, so let's uh, look at the application example. So, okay. Uh, here we have a signal with BPSK modulation that is transmitted through an intersatellite link between LEO and GEO satellites. Uh, so uh, here we consider a simple case where the satellites, satellite orbits lay in the same plane and the positions of the satellites relative to each other uh, is described in terms of phi angle. So to simulate uh, the free space channel, we use an FSO intersatellite channel module that defines the distance between the satellites, the pointing error uh, parameters, as well as the relative radial velocity and the other parameters of the transmitter and receiver. Uh, so uh, BPSK modulation is quite often used uh, in intersatellite links because it's a robust to large attenuations and the one issue that needs to be resolved is the Doppler frequency shift. So usually it is precompensated as the transmitter. So the transmitter frequency is adjusted to compensate the Doppler frequency shift. Uh, this uh, uh, frequency shift can be estimated uh, knowing the satellite orbits and their positions relative to each other. But still, there can be some residual frequency offset uh, that comes from some inaccuracies or errors. And uh, uh, this can be about several tens of uh, megahertz. Here we simulate this residual offset as a local oscillator offset set to 100 megahertz. To compensate the residual frequency offset as well as the phase noise, we use digital signal processing algorithms for frequency and phase recovery. Okay, so uh, now let's analyze uh, the performance of this system for different values of uh, phi angle for different configuration of uh, the satellites relative to each other. So we will run this simulation for uh, phi angle uh, from mi minus 90 to 90 degrees. Uh, here you can see uh, the dependence of relative radial velocity and distance between the satellites depending on the value of phi. Okay, it needs several seconds to finalize all the steps. Now we can have a look at the results. Uh, so, uh, the bit rate uh, changes with the phi uh, angle, so it is lower for lower phi because the satellite, uh, the distance between the satellites is uh, lower, and also the average attenuation in the link is also lower. Uh, but in general, the range in which the beta rate changes for different uh, angles or different satellite positions is not very uh, large. Here you can see also the example of a constellation diagram of the received signal for one of the link configurations. Okay, uh, so another issue that can be critical for this intersatellite link uh, is a pointing arrow. Uh, so here we have quite a large distance between the satellites. It's about 40,000 of kilometers. And even small pointing arrow can cause quite a high additional attenuation that can limit the link performance. 
For this, we uh, do investigate this effect. We will run this simulation for different values of a bias point in error. So here we uh, perform a bit simplified simulation. We will not accumulate the statistics for point in errors and just investigate the case of some uh, worst case transmission. Okay, so let's wait several seconds while it finishes the simulation. Yeah, while, while we wait for that, Rosa, I'll, I'll just say I'm seeing a few uh, Q&A uh, or questions being answered in, or asked in the Q&A. I also see a few being asked in the chat. If you could ask your questions in the Q&A um, box, then we'll get to them at the end of this, uh, at the end of the tutorial today. Yep. Yeah. okay. So now we can see the dependence of beta rate on point in narrow bias. And so this link, can operate for point and arrows smaller than um, about 10 or 12 microradian. And for high point and arrows, it's not possible to establish communication between the satellites. And here you can see uh, also the corresponding plot of beta rate versus received optical power. Uh, so the received optical power changes uh, for, for the value, different values of point and arrows. And uh, for example, uh, point in error equal to uh, 10 microradian corresponds to an additional attenuation of about uh, 20 dB already. So it's quite high. And uh, we see that it's uh, very important to um, align transmitter and receiver satellites as uh, well as possible to uh, reduce the effect of point in errors in such links. Okay, so that's all from my side. And thank yes. you for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Rosa. Um, at this point, we're going to turn things over to uh, Piotr Novik, who's going to be discussing uh, quantum key distribution or, or QKD, the simulation theory behind that, and then how QKD can actually be uh, implemented in, in satellite links and how we can simulate that. Um, so, so Piotr, we can, we can see your screen and uh, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Chris, <clears throat> uh, for giving me uh, the presentation. So, uh, from my side, we'll speak about the quantum key distribution because now it's a very popular uh, theme, the quantum key distribution or the free space, because in that case, uh, the satellites can be treated as a trusted mode. And using this uh, assumption, we can establish a really uh, a very, very high distance links between Alice and Bob. So, uh, and for these purposes, VPI provides so-called VPI toolkit QKD. Uh, it's not a standalone product, it's an add-on for the VPI transmission maker optical systems uh, environment. And uh, the purpose of this toolkit is to enable the system level CV and the VQPD uh, simulations. And our VPI toolkit provides models for QKD transmitters and receivers that allows you to simulate the QKD links and estimate the channel parameters, the secret key rate. And also we have several application examples that will show you how to use our toolkit. And uh, this toolkit can be used for uh, different purposes. So it can be used for the system design uh, where you can check various implementation options for your systems and subsystems. Also, it can be used for study of existing scenarios, which is very important. So if you want to study how does the classical signals affect uh, the quantum channels uh, through the Raman scattering or from the linear cross top. So you can easily calculate this using our software. Also, you can take into account uh, different component imperfections, such as the thermal and quantization noise on the receiver side or relative intensity noise or phase noise on the on transmitter side, and so on. Uh, also, it can be used to optimize the system parameters, such as protocol parameters as modulation amplitude, the number of photons per pulse, uh, the basis probabilities. Also, it can be used to optimize the electronic bandwidth and so on. And finally, it can be used to estimate different useful metrics for QKD links, such as maximum possible secret key rate for a given distance or maximum transmission dis distance and many more. So, 
Now let's discuss how we can use the classical simulation framework for simulating the quantum gate distribution. So uh, we currently focus on modern and weak coherent prepare and measure DV and CV QKD protocols, which nowadays is a practical QKD technology. So weak coherent means that we are using as a light source a highly attenuated laser pulses, while prepare and measure is a counterpart to entangled based protocols, and that means that Alice first prepares uh, the quantum states of light, then she sends these states through the channel, and then Bob's measures the received uh, message from Alice. And such approach gives us several benefits. So first of all, with the signal representation. So the here states can be labeled by the quadratures Q and P. Uh, and these uh, quadratures Q and P can be represented by real and imaginary components of the classical amplitude A. But the rule uh, connecting the Q and P quadratures and real and imaginary parts are a bit complicated, and we'll discuss this in the next slide. And that allows us to reuse the current signal representation from the UPI design suite. Also, uh, the coherent states are the most classical quantum states of light. So that means that the transformation rules of the quantum amplitudes alpha are the same as for the classical signals A in the linear component. So we don't need to introduce uh, changes into existing model algorithms. And that means that we can reuse a huge, a huge amount of modules provided by the design suite. Uh, moreover, uh, if we can neglect the nonlinear effects, we can also reuse the nonlinear components in our simulations. Also, if we choose the sampling rate rather high, so we can distinguish several coherent states per symbol, and that will allow us to model the realistic waveforms, and therefore we will be able to model the filtering effect on the signal or the jitter and many more. And the last but not least, how do we model the noise? So the most important are the quantum fluctuations and they are modeled in the receivers by the shot noise of the heterodyne or homodyne receiver in CVQQD application or by the photon counting in the single photon detectors in the VQQD applications. The electrical excess noise can be modeled as a voltage fluctuations and the optical excess noise such as the Raman scattering noise or relative intensity noise is modeled as a quadrature fluctuations of these QNP components. So now let's talk a bit how do we connect the uh, quantum amplitudes alpha and the classical uh, amplitudes A. So here you can see the representation of the uh, multi-mode coherent state that uh, presents a train of pulses in the quantum mechanics. And for this, we have to use the bra and cat vectors. But the purpose of the VPI QQD toolkit is to hide such complexity and uh, to make it available for the engineers so they can just specify the number of photons in pulse, for example, and the wave shape of the pulse. And to do to make it available, so we do everything in, on our side, all the com uh, complicated calculations. And basically using this uh, relation, we are able to match the power electric field and power spectrum expectation values with the classical results. And as I mentioned, VPI QKD Toolkit provides a building blocks and we divide it into two large libraries. So the first library is the CV QKD library, and here we provide idealized coherent transmitter. So here is the heterodyne receiver, both idealized and very realistic model. And in addition, we provide modules for the symbol selection and post processing. So we provide a random number generator for sampling Gaussian modulated color shares. Also, we have modules to estimate the channel transmittance and excess noise, as well as secret key rate estimators, both for asymptotic and finite size scenarios for Gaussian modulated CVQD. The second large category is the VQQD. And for the VQQD, we also provide a huge library of modules for different protocols. So we have a bunch of receivers and transmitters for differential phase shift protocol, uh, a couple of uh, transmitters for BB84-like protocols with decoy states, including the polarization encoding, phase time encoding, so-called uh, T12 protocol. And also we have a module for coherent one-way protocol. 
Also here for the DVTKD purposes, we have the random number generators, the sifter that will check that the basis matches. And also we have modules for secret fraction estimator for T12 protocol and COW protocol. And as a receiver here, we have a model of the single photon detector. And our single photon detector model includes uh, a lot of different imperfections, such as the dead time, the Gaussian and exponential time and jitter, the after pulsing effect, the dark counts, and also uh, we can model externally gated uh, as pads. So, uh, when we were developing our VPI toolkit QKD, uh, the main purpose was to uh, verify that our models are correct. And for this, uh, we use the paper of the Fabio Landenbach, where he performed an excellent analysis of different noise sources in the CVKD applications. And he derived analytical formulas for the noise. And so we used, we did several simulations to compare our simulation result with analytical results. So, and here you can see this comparison between our simulation results uh, represented with orange point and the theoretical formulas represented with a green line. So you can see that our simulation results are in a very good agreement with the theoretical predictions. And now let's switch to the application examples. So, uh, as I mentioned, so the QQD over satellite links now is very popular because we can establish QQD links over high uh, distances. And as I mentioned, we can reuse different uh, modules provided by the design suite in the quantum simulations. And now we reuse the free space op optical channel to calculate the link attenuation between satellite and the ground station. And so here you can see how does the link attenuation depends on the distance and the receiver's aperture. And so here you can see that the Link detonation varies from 10 dB to uh, almost 40 or even 50 dB. And all our first studies basically were inspired by the paper mentioned in the bottom of the slide. So when we're talking about the satellite links, the first that we need to investigate, how does the sifted key rate and secret key rate depends on the distance between the ground station and satellite. So here you can see when the distance increases, of course, the losses also increases, and we have that the sifted key rate decreases, of course, and therefore the secret key rate also decreases for. And so basically here we investigated how it depends for different aperture diameters, and the higher aperture diameter, the lower our losses. So we can see this in the slide. And also when uh, the attenuation uh, increases, so our pulses that comes to the receiver become weaker, and therefore the contribution uh, from the dark counts became uh, relevant. And here we can see that Hubert also increases. <clears throat> that also uh, influences the QQD link performance and we get a lower secret key rate. Uh, also what is important in uh, satellite communication uh, for QQD, uh, is uh, taking into account the, the background noise. So you know that the uh, that um, uh, quantum states are very fragile and even very uh, low intensity light can uh, destroy our QQD link. So and here we perform the analysis. How does the background noise influence uh, our QQD link? So, and we can see that uh, under the night condition, we can easily establish uh, the QQD link, and the background noise doesn't influence our link. But under the daylight condition, the background noise becomes too high, and here we get a negative secret key rate. So that means that we cannot establish such link. And also, so we can see that in an early morning, we can still perform the QQD communication. And also, so here you can see the simulation parameters that we used. So here we used the filter bandwidth 0.2 nanometers. And that means that we, if we decrease the filter bandwidth, uh, we can also tolerate the uh, background noise under the daylight conditions. But nowadays, such very narrow band filters are not available. Uh, and one more example that can be interesting for us uh, is how does the sifted key rate and QBear depends uh, on the time during the satellite bypass. So 
Uh, here we have numbered the satellite positions, and we can see how the, the distance and the sifted period depends on the uh, number of the satellite position. So, and we can see that the lowest value of the Q pair we get when the distance is the lowest, as well as the zenith angle. And for this point, we also get uh, the highest the, the highest sifted Q rate. And also here we can see that there is some constant Q bar level and this Q bar is caused by the after pulsing effect. But so in other points when the distance N is high and attenuation is uh, also high, again the dark columns become relevant and they also contribute a lot to the Q bar. And now I will show how it does it look in the uh, our simulator. So uh, in this schematic, so we have the analysis PKD transmitter, basically it's represented by these two modules. So here we provide the basis and bit information to the transmitter where we create an optical signal. Then we perform propagation of this optical signal through the free space channel. And also here we add the Gaussian white noise to uh, take into consideration the background noise. So after here we have an additional attenuator to take into account uh, imperfections of the receiver, so several some losses on the receiver side, and also here we have this filter to suppress the background noise. Finally, on this side we have a receiver that measures the incoming signals and it outputs us uh, the bit uh, string uh, produced by Bob. After we have a sifter where we check that the bases matches with, with each other. And after we perform the sifting, we are able to estimate the Q pair of the given link. And also we have a module uh, that estimates the secret key rate of the given link. And so, uh, as I mentioned, so we were simulating the satellite bypass. So here you can see the orbit uh, of the satellite and this green region response to the part of the orbit where, where we can still perform the uh, communication over this channel. And here you can see how the, does the distance depends on the satellite position and how does the zenith angle depends on the satellite position depending on its uh, uh, angle uh, phi. So, uh, using our software, uh, you are free to investigate the various effects and how does they influence the uh, QQD link performance, uh, such as the dark count rate, the after pulsing probability. Also, you can check how does the mean photon number influences the secret and sifted key rate of the link. And uh, finally, also you can take into consideration how does uh, that time uh, limits your QQD link performance. So that's uh, the simulations that I wanted to show you. And now we are free to ask your questions. Yeah, yeah, th thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. But I'd like to thank everybody again for your time. Um, again, please contact us about a potential evaluation and fill out the survey at the end of this, but I appreciate everybody's time. And thank you, Jose and Optica for, for helping us organize this. Thank you very much for a fantastic experience. Until the next time, please make sure that you continue being Optica. See you. Bye-bye.